Today is a, today is a feast, the Assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary. It, uh, the Assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary, it was, the church always held that, even from earliest times. However, it was never defined as a doctrine. So the church believed it. And it was, I believe, in 1950, Pope Pius XII declared as a doctrine. He actually sent a letter out to all the bishops throughout the world. And he wanted to get their consensus, what they thought and what the faithful thought. And then he said something to the effect that it's God, it, he sees as God's will that all the people believe the assumption that it should be declared as a dogma. dogma and so he did, in fact, do that declared a dogma of the faith, he saw our Lady is assumed into heaven, body and soul. And this being said, in honor of that glorious event, uh, Pope Pius XII Institute uh, had a new mass composed in honor of the Blessed Mother and also in the office, there was a new, ma a new office composed for the priest recite and recite the divine prayer prayers. The there are several announcements in the bulletin. Please note that for the schedule for this coming week, no Mass scheduled tomorrow. Uh, Monday through Friday, Mass at 8 a.m. Next Saturday, Mass at 9 a.m. Preceded by confessions on Saturday. Just please note the other announcements. Also, the Roman Catholic Magazine is a summer issue. It's a few, couple months late. It's a summer issue. The magazine is available in the vestibule of the church. Um, if the usher would please pass them out, I'd appreciate that. And once again, just to the teenagers, uh, take a, and I'd encourage you to do so, take a magazine, the Roman Catholic magazine, put it in your, make it your part of your library, uh, read it first, and then make it part of your library, put it in the pamphlets that I have pr produced and made available, that you will start acquiring uh, uh, your library. This being said, um, read them, read them, and get to know them. Uh, could you imagine, I, and we, we have to do that, we, could, we just can't be content with saying, well, I went to summer school or I read the catechism, I studied, I made my first communion, and we can't, we, we can't just be content with that. What would you expect of a doctor, a lawyer, a priest, anyone who, some professional of some sort or another, whatever it might be, a farmer, a rancher? If they're just going to rely upon what they learned as a kid, as a child, and maybe they first when they went to school, they learned this and didn't keep up with it. Well, just know this: because of fallen human nature, our intellect has been weakened, and because of that, and darkened, as some theologians say, that we forget. And if we don't go back and read and reread and remind ourselves, uh, we will soon forget, and pretty soon we're just relying upon what we think we read or we thought we might have known and we, and we can become mistaken. I mean, just take for example how much you know. If I were to have anyone, every one of you, to stand up in line and I, I ask you a question of the catechism. Let's say for example I asked you, uh, give me the definition of uh, sanctifying grace, definition of grace. What is the catechism, what is the, the, the answer, what is grace? Could you answer that question? Well, based upon what I know, I probably would, couldn't answer it myself. Well, I could, but we forget. That's the point. We forget. How many times have I, you know, over the years, I've asked some for the question like, "What is a sacrament?" and start giving a, a general, vague answer, sort of skirting around the issue, not really giving the answer. I mean, a sacrament, for example, is an outward sign instituted by, by Christ to give grace. Uh, that answer came out rolling off your lips, and yet. Because we don't go back and read or reread, study, restudy, we forget and we have sort of a general vague idea, but that's what it is. It's general and it's vague. So the point is, acquire the, read these articles, study them, go back and read them again. I, a good practice maybe would be to make <clears throat> a list of all the different subjects you have, whether it's a book or a pamphlet or a mag the magazine, the different articles there, what they are, maybe the titles and the subjects of each one. And so something comes up, you're talking to somebody, you can go back and go right to the booklet, right to the book, right to the pamphlet, whatever it might be, look it up, read it, and then when the question comes up, you can go back and you can have the answers. Not some vague general thing, but specifically uh, exactly what you know what you're talking about. So the magazine is available. Once again, if the usher pass it out after Mass, I'd appreciate that. The epistle point for today's Mass is taken from the, the uh, 
is taken from the book of Judith, chapter 13, verses 22 through 25, chapter 15, verse 10. The Lord hath blessed thee by his power, because by thee he hath brought our enemies to naught. Blessed art thou, O daughter, by the Lord, the most high God, above all women upon the earth. Blessed be the Lord who made heaven and earth, who hath directed thee in the cutting off the head of the prince of our enemies, because he has so magnified thy name this day, that thy praise shall not depart out of the mouth of men, who shall be mindful of the power of the Lord forever. For that thou hast not spared thy life by reason of the distress and tribulation of thy people, but hast prevented our ruin in the presence of our God. Thou art the glory of Jerusalem, thou art the joy of Israel, thou art the honor of our people. The gospel appointed for today's mass is taken from the gospel of St. Luke chapter, four, chapter 1, verses 41 through 50. At that time, Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost, and she cried out with a loud voice and said, Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. And whence it is to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, as soon as the voice of thy salutation sounded in my ears, the infant in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed art thou that hast believed, because those things shall come be accomplished, which were spoken, of, spoken to thee by the Lord. And Mary said, My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior, because he hath regarded the humility of his handmaid. For behold, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed, because he that is mighty hath done great things to me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is from generation unto generation to them that fear him. Thus far the words of today's holy gospel. Thou art the glory of Jerusalem, thou art the joy of Israel, thou art the honor of our people. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. St. Paul started out persecuting the early Christians. As a, as a young boy, he was present when St. Stephen was stoned. In fact, they, the, the, the ones who stoned St. Stephen laid their garments so they could un unencumber themselves, so they could be more accurate with their throwing their rocks, and they stoned St. Stephen, Stephen to death. And St. Paul was there. As St. Paul eventually grew up, and he became zealous in persecuting the Christians, gathering them up, uh, and ending up putting them into prison, whatever they did. And, but then, of course, we know that St. Paul was converted to the faith. And what he said was, he says that, I chastise my body daily. After less preaching to others, I might lose my soul. He was conscious of the fact that he had to be careful that he might not fall into sin, that he'd fall away and maybe lose his soul. However, that being said, after spending half of his life being a persecutor of Christ, he wrote uh, these words. He, he says, I am filled with comfort. I exceedingly bound with joy in all our tribulations he says, for the been laid up for me a crown of justice, which the Lord, the just judge, will render me on that day. That thought of his reward in some distant ante anticipation, some distance, distant glory awaited him for just half of his life when he was a follower of Christ. Uh, the mere thought so encouraged him that he would look upon all the trials of this life as pleasures. I'll use the word pleasures. So what do you think would have been, how it must have been with Our Lady when she saw the crown of glory no longer at a distance, but there resting on her head for the rest of her life for all eternity? What sort of crown was it? What sort of glory was hers? And what would have been her joy at that point? If St. Paul, he says, he said, abounds with, abound with joy, he said, at this future glory that he awaited as a reward. St. Burns is only our Lord could give the answer to what, that, that, the, the, what he reserved for Our Lady. And we, we know the blessed in heaven are filled with joy and happiness. There's nothing more they can wish for 
the happiness of them put all together, I would imagine if you could accumulate all the happiness of all the saints and angels in heaven, it would, if we could accumulate it, would probably fall, it would surely fall far short of the happiness of Our Lady now that she's crowned a queen of heaven and earth. So at the departure of Our Lady from this life, at her death, which is only for an instant, our Lord uh, t taken her up to heaven. And I think we, I'd like to try to, maybe, maybe we could try to get some idea of the abundance of her joy and the glory as far as we could possibly understand it. For certain in this life, we have no concept of heaven. We have an idea, but everything we have, anything we could say, any analogy we could give is gonna fall short. But just imagine the happiness of a mother who would be rejoined with her son. I think if anything, fathers and mothers could understand this. If, for example, their son left home at a young age, uh, and just imagine the happiness of a mother who, when her son should come home. So uh, let's say after not seeing for 20 years, the, just imagine the tears of joy that you would, the welcome that a mother or father would give to their son upon his return. That being said, we go to the Old Testament, we find there um, where Joseph, one of the 12 tribes of Israel, one of the tribe, 12 tribes of, of, uh, of Patriot, or the son of, Patriot, of Jacob, uh, his brothers threw him into a cistern. He was found by, I believe, the Egyptians. He was taken to Egypt and his father, Jacob, thought that he was lost forever. He thought he had died. In fact, I think his brothers told him that. Uh, Jacob, or Joseph's brothers told him that. And yet, when there was a famine in the land of, uh, of where Jacob was, they heard that Israel had much food over there, so the, all the tribe of Jacob, of Israel, went to Egypt. And imagine the surprise of Jacob when he saw his son second in command next to the king of Egypt. When he embraced him, can you imagine that the, the old man could almost die for joy. Certainly he desired nothing more. He says, now shall I die with joy because I've seen thy face, his son Joseph's face. He says, now I can die for joy because of the happiness that he would have. And then another example of the Old Testament, Anna. Not Saint Anne, but Anna. Uh, the wife of Tobias. Their son, Tobias, Tobias Jr., went off to Dis's land to, and she missed him tremendously. And she would leave her house and go to, to a nearby hill, from what I, gather, what I recall in scripture, and she would be looking off the distance and finally her perseverance was rewarded and her son Tobias was coming back and at a distance she recognized him and she went running back to the house, told her husband Tobias uh, and he was blind and he rising up blind began to run stumbling over whatever was in his way and giving his hand to a servant he and his wife Anna ran out to meet their son Tobias, receiving him, kissed him, and they began to weep for joy. Weep for joy. So imagine, judge yourself, the joy that Our Lady had when she, after being assumed into heaven, she entered into heaven and there she saw, the gates of heaven were opened, there she saw her son, our Lord Jesus Christ, whom she bore in her womb. She brought forth the sable in Bethlehem, brought him up in the workshop as a poor carpenter with Saint Joseph. And then with her own eyes at the foot of the cross, she seen him, she seen him hanging on that shameful gibbet of the cross, hanging between two thieves and then dying in agony. Tradition says that after the crucifixion, after the burial of our Lord, when our Lord rose from the dead, tradition, of course, right reason would confirm that, that our Lord appeared to her and there wiped away the, the tears in her eyes for she seen him. But then he ascended to heaven and then she 
was without him, whom she loved, whom she, 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 she sought, if you will. And then when she, after being assumed to heaven, she entered into heaven, and there she saw her son in all his glory, seated on the right hand of his father, uh, ruling the universe, there meeting her with all the choirs of the angels, embracing her, placing her on the throne beside him, and declaring her, crowning her, as queen of heaven and earth, whom virgins, confessors, martyrs, prophets, apostles, the angels, all the elect, all the elect. What do you think her joy was at that point? We'll never ever really know in this world, but know that she had joy. And when we honor her, it's gonna, if possible, augment that joy that she has. And so let that be a source of contemplation, considering what she looked forward to. Consider Anna and Tobias, or Jacob, even St. Paul. And the little that we have here is nothing compared to the joys of heaven. And knowing that, let's not be distracted, turned aside in any way, jeopardize that joy that waits us likewise when we should enter into heaven. May God bless you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.